Hello and welcome! I'm Jacob Newman, and this is the first of several video lectures I plan on doing covering basic category theory. This video talks about various constructions you can do in basic set theory, but with a category theoretic mindset. The sequence of topics in this video will serve as a basic blueprint for what I'm going to cover in subsequent videos. So some basic background. Set theory is a branch of mathematics, but more broadly, it's also a framework for doing any kind of mathematics. The core ideas of set theory originated in the 19th century with the work of Cantor, Dedekind, and others to try to mathematically study infinity. Set theory matured significantly over subsequent decades and ultimately served as the main solution to the foundational crisis mathematics underwent in the early part of the 20th century. To this day, most working mathematicians primarily work with objects which are quote-unquote built out of sets, like graphs, vector spaces, topologies, and groups, to name a few. And one of the remarkable things about set theory is its ability to encode a wide variety of mathematical disciplines. Another big advantage of set theory, and one of its central features, is its amenability to formal axiomatization. The standard formalization of set theory are the zermelo frankel axioms, plus or minus some axioms, which serve as a formal, purely logical expression of set theory. I won't talk much about formalization here, but if you're interested in the topic, you should definitely check out homotopy type theory, which is an alternative foundation for mathematics, inspired a lot by category theory, and its primary design feature is its amenability to formalization. Category theory is another branch of mathematics which also has these foundational ambitions. Category theory emerged in the 1940s and came into its mature form through the 1950s and 60s, and it's continued to expand and develop since. Category theory doesn't contradict set theory, but rather it views the same concepts and techniques from a different perspective. And category theory proves rich enough to serve as an alternative foundation for all of mathematics. One of the early recognizers of category theory's foundational potential was Bill Levere. His 1964 manuscript, An Elementary Theory of the Category of Sets, proposed a combination of the set and category theoretic approaches, studying the category of sets. This video is loosely inspired by this paper. We're going to do a bunch of category theory, but we won't need to mention categories once. Everything will be phrased in terms of sets. Then in future videos, We'll explicitly define what a category is and see abstract category theoretic descriptions of the things we're covering here. One final general note, this video is designed to be understandable to anyone who's done basic work with sets and logic, and you don't need to know any further math. That said, I will move quickly. If you're less experienced with sets, functions, and relations, and writing proofs involving them, you're definitely encouraged to pause the video frequently and think things through more carefully. In particular, you can stop to prove some of the claims I make, or make an informal argument fully rigorous. There will also be occasional check your understanding questions, which provide you a quick test to see if you're ready to proceed to the next idea or section. I'll sometimes solve or go over the solution to a problem, just to give you an example, so hopefully you have some sense of what a correct answer might look like. It's not necessary you become an expert on each thing I mention, don't get too bogged down in the details but the more you understand, the better. With that, let's go ahead and dive in. Since set theory is intended as a foundation for mathematics, what it can't do is import notions from other branches of math. Everything we want to work with, we're going to have to build up from first principles. So set theory only has one primitive concept, sets and then everything else is built out of sets. So informally what a set is, is it's a collection of things. And these things can be numbers, symbols, words, vectors, cows, horses, pigs, whatever. And most importantly, the elements of a set can be other sets. So I can have a set containing a set. That'll be really important later. Sometimes it's possible to list out the elements of a set explicitly. And so I'll do that like this, of a list of things contained between two curly braces. When I write curly brace 0, 5, 7, 4, close curly brace, that denotes the set with exactly four elements, 0, 5, 7, and 4. 
and I'll use this epsilon looking symbol, which we just pronounce as in, to mean that something is an element of a set. So zero is in the set 0574, i.e. it's an element of that set. And likewise with seven. And then I'll write that symbol with a slash through it to mean that it's not an element of the set. So three is not an element of this set because it's not one of the four things I listed there. So an important principle in set theory is that sets are only defined by what's in them. So in particular, when I write out a set like this and I list the elements in some order, the order doesn't matter. For instance, the set 0574 is exactly the same set as 4507. And also everything is either an element of the set or not. There's no notion of being a double element or something like that. So if I list out the same thing a bunch of different times, that's still the same set. So here's a quick summary of everything I just said. Informally, a set is a collection of elements, which could be anything, including other sets. A set X is defined by the elements which are in X. So for each little x, we use this notation to indicate whether x is in x or not in x. And if two sets have the exact same elements, then that means they are the same set. So a more formal way to say that is that if a is in x, if and only if a is in y, then that means that x is equal to y. This last condition is called the principle of set extensionality, and it's a fundamental axiom of set theory. The other main thing that we're going to be concerned with in addition to sets are functions. Informally, a function is a thing that transforms the elements of one set into elements of another. So each function goes from one set, called its domain, and to another set, called its codomain. And the domain and the codomain can be the same set. And so what the function does is assign to each element of its domain an element of its codomain. So we write f of x for the element that x gets sent to by f. When defining a function, you have to satisfy two conditions called totality and single-valuedness. And I'm not going to get too much into the precise details of what those are, but what they basically say is that for any element x of the domain, we can unambiguously figure out what f of x is and f of x is indeed an element of the codomain. Now, I said a minute ago that in set theory, you have to build everything out of sets, and that includes functions too. And so there's a standard way in set theory to represent functions as certain sets. But I'm not gonna bother with that. We're just going to take functions as primitive. And so we have a nicer notation to indicate what the domain and codomain of a given function are. So we'll write f colon x arrow y to indicate that f is a function and its domain is x, and its codomain is y, where x and y, of course, are sets. For most functions, f of x is going to be given by some expression depending on x, which identifies a unique element of the codomain. So for instance, if x is a real number, then 3x squared plus 5 is an expression. We can substitute in any real number for x and get a real number out. So this defines a function from real numbers to real numbers. To express this more compactly, we'll use a notation called lambda notation, which looks like this. So if f is given as lambda z dot e, then we can obtain f of x by substituting x for z in e, and then calculating out which element of y this determines. For instance, lambda x dot x plus x defines a function from real numbers to real numbers. To apply to some given real number, say 4, then we substitute 4 for x in the expression x plus x, and then calculate that this determines the real number 8. Similarly, applying it to 2.1 gives 4.2. Here's another example, which takes a pair of real numbers and returns the square root of the sum of their squares, which is going to be a non-negative real number. So if I apply it to the pair of 3, 4, then I substitute in 3 for x and 4 for y, and calculate that that gives out 5. Note that we could have made the codomain here all real numbers instead of just the non-negative ones. Technically, that would have been a different function. A function is defined by its domain, its codomain, and how it transforms elements of its domain to elements of its codomain. If I change the codomain, I've changed the function. 
And here's a construction we'll use sometimes, conditionals. In this example, we define a function which takes a natural number n, and if n is even, returns 1, and otherwise returns 0. So 3, for example, is not even, so applying this function to 3 yields 0. 0 is even, so applying this function to 0 returns 1. So here's an important principle. If f and g are functions with the same domain and the same codomain, and which transform elements in the same way, then they are the same function. Transforming elements in the same way means that for every element x of the domain, f of x is the same as g of x. We call this the principle of function extensionality. So, so far we've seen sets and we've seen functions. These are the two basic objects that we're going to work with for the rest of this lecture. Everything else we're going to build out of sets and functions. So let's see what we can do with that. Here's one thing we can do. Compose functions. Given g and f, such that the codomain of f is the domain of g, we can form a function g compose f, which does f and then does g. So you can see in the lambda notation, it takes some x, applies f to it, and then applies g to it. So this is a kind of operation that we can use to take two functions whose domain, domains and codomains agree in this particular way and combine them to get another function. And notice that the domain of g compose f is the domain of f, and the codomain of g compose f is the codomain of g. So we're going to do a lot of things involving composition. Here's another basic thing we can define, the identity function. This is a function with the same domain and codomain, which takes an element and just returns that element. The notation lambda x dot x says that it takes in x, which is an element of the set x, and returns it. We'll denote this function id x. The subscript x indicates that there's one of these functions for every single set x. Identity functions and compositions are going to be the key elements defining the category of sets. And so we're going to see all the things we can do just using identities and composition. So here's some facts you can prove about how identity and composition work together. Notice that all of these ask you to prove equalities between functions. So you're going to need the principle of function extensionality in order to do that. So let me conclude this video by doing one of these examples. So I'll prove that for all functions f from some set x to some other set y, that if I do the identity of y composed with f, that's going to be the same thing as f itself. So the first thing here to check is that the domains and codomains work out. So f has domain x and codomain y. And so in order for this composition to make sense, the identity of y uh, has to have the same domain as the codomain of f. And so the codomain of f is y. And then the domain and codomain of the identity on y is y. And so this composition uh, makes sense. So like I said, we'll use the principle of function extensionality. So we need to prove that for all x in x, the identity on y composed with f applied to x is f of x. So remember the principle of function extensionality says that if I have two functions, so this and this function and this function, if I have two functions and which are the same on all elements of the, their domain, then those are the same function. And so to prove this, I just need to calculate the left-hand side and calculate the right-hand side and show that they're the same. So start by writing the left-hand side here, the identity y composed with f applied to x. 
And so that's the same thing. So let me expand out the identity on, let me expand out what the identity on Y is. So the identity on Y is lambda Y dot Y. So it takes a Y and returns a Y. That's what the identity function is. Composed with F. Applied to X. Now let me expand out this composition. So this takes a, I'll call it X naught. And then it will apply lambda Y dot Y to F of X naught. And this is all applied to X. So now I plug in x for x naught in this expression. That's how function application works. And so I get lambda y dot y applied to f of x. And then I substitute f of x in for y in y. And I get f of x. And so I've shown that for arbitrary x, the left-hand side, identity of y composed f applied to, applied to x is the same thing as f applied to x. And so by function extensionality, identity of y composed with f is the same thing as f itself. And so I'm done. In the next video, we're going to use function composition and the identity functions to phrase some of the standard constructions in set theory and start to build some of the basic tools and techniques that will become central to category theory. Thanks for watching.